spaces. Um, before we begin today, I'd like to acknowledge country. I'm on Wurundjeri country of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Acknowledge that sovereignty over this land has never been ceded and it is and always will be Aboriginal land and pay respects to elders past and present out of all of the nations that everyone here is on and also um, acknowledge the wisdom of First Nations people here, um, including a couple of our guest speakers today, um, Palawa Elder Rodney Dillon and Noongar woman Roxanne Moore, um, and pay respects to your elders as well. And we're talking about a very important topic here around over-policing, and it definitely goes without saying that um, over-policing impacts First Nations communities first and worse, and this crisis has been no different. So um, really important topic and glad to see so many people here talking about it. Uh, my name is Kirsty. I'm the Executive Director at Australian Progress, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session of Australia at Home. Um, Australia at Home exists to bring together civil society to discuss the critical issues and how um, it's affecting different communities in this crisis. So today we'll be talking about over-policing and um, the incarceration system. Um, Jess has just introduced herself in the chat. So down the bottom in the middle, she will be our tech support for the day. So if you have any issues um, with tech, you can message Jess in the tech support. Um, I'd also recommend if you can to put on your video so you can, um, we can see everyone's faces. It's a space um, to you know, cheer each other on and especially the people doing the important work around um, ending over policing and mass incarceration. Um, and then if you go up to the top right corner, you'll see nine little squares. Um, I recommend spending, clicking that and spending the um, next hour in gallery view. So that'll give you a chance to see all the speakers and, um, and each other as well. Um, so Australia at Home, just a bit of background, is a, a project of essential um, the Guardian, Principal Co, Australian Progress, Community Council of Australia and Australian Conservation Foundation. And um, this will be recorded, so I recommend afterwards if you can share it around with your friends. And we'll keep you on mute most of the time, um, unless you have a question that you'd like to ask. And so if you want to ask a question, you can go out down into the chat and post it. You can also use the chat to introduce yourself. So I'd recommend if you can now maybe introduce your name, um, where you are, um, if you're part of an organisation, you can do that now in the chat. So introduce yourself in the chat and we'll have um, as a space to ask questions and add comments and links over the course of the hour. We want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, and then finally, the only other ground rule is that um, this is, uh, you know, a work in progress um, gathering online. So if any of the tech fails at any point, please bear with us. I did hear that Zoom had an outage yesterday. So we'll just be um, generous with each other as we go through. But that's all the housekeeping for today. So I'd now like to um, get into the conversation. And it's a very important conversation around how this crisis has been used by the justice system to further, um, further criminalise people in poverty, First Nations communities, people with disability, uh, and so on, and some of the real threats to those communities within the justice system. So we're gonna hear from three incredible speakers today. And if at any point you have any comments or questions, please chuck them in the chat and we'll have a chance for Q&A as we go on. Um, but first up, um, we're gonna hear from Roxanne Moore, who's the Executive Officer of NATSOS to kind of share a bit of the context and what's happening in this moment. She'll be followed by Rodney Diller, who's the Indigenous Rights Advisor at Amnesty, and then Anthony Kelly, who's the Executive Officer at the Flemington Kensington Community Legal Centre. So I'll throw to you first, Roxanne, to kick us off. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge country. Um, I'm very lucky to live um, on Coolan land in Melbourne and pay my respects to elders past, present, and those yet to come. Uh, my name is Roxanne. I'm a proud Noongar woman and the Executive Officer of NATSALS. That's the national peak body for all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services in Australia. Um, so we have seven community controlled legal services um, and 
uh, all about um, supporting our mob through the issues and injustices that they face um, in the justice system. Um, so in terms of um, this pandemic, um, we've seen a lot of a lot of really concerning issues happening for our people. Um, so our main focus has been around trying to prevent Aboriginal deaths in custody. Um, if we look at um, the actual threat to prisons itself, um, prisons, um, like other confined environments, you know, like nursing homes or factories that we've seen where there's outbreaks, it just absolutely spreads like wildfire. Um, it's a very contained environment. Um, and even while the um, cases are decreasing in the broader community, um, the risk remains really high in prisons. And for Aboriginal people, it's even higher because for various um, reasons around the legacy of colonisation and discrimination and dispossession of land in this country, um, our people are over incarcerated. And that over incarcerated is now, incarceration is now compounded with the fact that um, our people are more likely to um, contract and to die from coronavirus. And that's due to comorbidity factors around health. So a lot of our people um, experience chronic illnesses um, and uh, people living with disability. Um, a lot of our, our people in prison are um, women, for example, who are themselves victims of family violence. So um, a lot of our mob who are in prison are um, really at risk. And then compounded with that again is the higher risk of deaths in custody for our people. Um, so we've been working in particular with families who have lost loved ones to deaths in custody, and they released um, an open letter um, calling on a, a number of um, things that the government needs to do. And NATSAL similarly has released um, our policy positions. And as um, Kirsty indicated, like it's a lot broader than just looking at prisons. You know, we really need to stop the flow of people coming into the justice system during this time. And that is very much connected to the over-policing issues that we're going to discuss today, but also to the social supports and family supports that need to be in place. It's really just highlighted the weaknesses of the whole system and how that interacts with um, pushing people into the justice system, um, criminalising poverty. Um, so, for example, housing um, is a huge issue for our people, particularly in remote, remote and regional areas, but also in urban um, settings. Um, and the housing um, crisis has really, um, has really been highlighted during this pandemic as, as something that needs to be worked on. And we we're going to be feeling the impacts of this pandemic for a really long time. But for those of you that are kind of new to the issue of, um, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the justice system, it's clear from the research um, that those sort of underlying factors around um, housing, family violence, child removals, um, employment, um, education, all of those factors um, mean that it's more likely um, for our mob to come into contact with the justice system. Um, but then also the racial profiling, over-policing, um, discrimination um, and unfairness that exists um, within current laws around the justice system as well. Um, so that's just a, a small snapshot of um, what we've been looking at. Um, there's actually, since the 8th of May, there's been four deaths in custody. Um, and they're not, none of them are Aboriginal to our knowledge. Um, however, we feel like prison is no place for a pandemic and it's just really a, a ticking time bomb um, before, um, before um, it's too late for our people and, and there's a death in custody. Thank you so much, Roxanne. And this is a um, really important conversation. I know, Rodney, you were talking about um, some of the impacts around housing and what's the policing happening in remote communities. So I might throw to you to share a bit of what you've been seeing and hearing is happening in this crisis. Yeah, thank you. Just, it's also about history as well. I'd also like to acknowledge our ancestors um, from all around the country and 
today it is easier for us to talk about Aboriginal issues than what it's ever been, I think, and that's why um, it's important for us to talk about them um, and recognise the things that's happened in our past. Um, just to talk about a bit about housing, we've known that housing has always been overpopulated for a good while, and we know in the Northern Territory, it's not just the Northern Territory, Western Australia, other places have got the same going on. But um, for years in the Northern Territory, there was a lot of money put towards housing, but because it's so expensive to build houses in that area, and the houses they built was never probably to a quality or to a standard for people to live in in the first place. So in saying that, and a lot of money was wasted, a lot of Aboriginal money was wasted in this area and never spent in the place where it was meant to be spent. So we've always been short on housings and I've been to areas where you've had up to 20 people living in a two bedroom um, type of tin shed with no hot water and all they've used is an old 45 kilo gas bottle as a makeshift hot water system. And these people have been paying good rent, like big rent, to live in these. The, the money comes out of their rent first up before they even get their welfare. This money is taken out. So the government decides how much rent they're going to take off them. And it doesn't matter where they're living. The people can be living under blue plastic, like there was 100 living under blue plastic at Utopia um, in the rain, old people in the rain. But yet they were still having their, um, their money taken out of their welfare for rent. So the housing itself has always been a problem and it's still a problem today. We know that overcrowding, um, the, the issues with poverty, not unlike what Rox is talking about with the, we're almost prosecuted by postcodes sometimes. Um, and you have a look at housing is the same. And we know that some of these houses have got 20 to 30 people in them. And in, in um, Tennant Creek, just recently, we had people calling us talking about the army and the police going in and counting how many people in, was in the houses. Well, they knew before they went in those houses how many people was in there. And some of them people would have had to flee from them houses. And where was they to go? You know, they'd go to the next house and to the next house. And if, you know, when you've got the army and the police coming to say that you can only have so many in a house, when for, for, for many years, there's been overcrowding in these houses and there's not the housing there for them. And, and some of the reasons for that is that people have came in from off country to get to get uh, for health reasons, um, and when they come in for medical reasons, they usually stay with other family because they can't afford to to put up anywhere. So that's one of the reasons why some people come in close to the city and with stay with their family, and that's what Aboriginal people have done for thousands of years: stayed with each family, welcome in the family, and welcome out. Um, so these are some of the things that's happening when people are moving in. Also, people have been moving off their country and we fought for stop them from moving people off their country 10 years ago. And now what they're doing, they're saying to the people that's on welfare, uh, if you don't move into the cities to do the training, we'll stop your welfare. So there's another thing that's causing problems within this system. People have to move into Tennant Creek and to other towns like Elliot and Catherine and places like that. They, they're moving two or 300 kilometres in to go to do this training. Training for jobs that will never be there, but that it satisfies the white people that they've got this training done and they can tick the box. And it's just, it's they would be better off having them working in their own community and training them in that community, but they've got to come off their country and go two or 300 kilometres in to do this training, which is, which is not right. So there's some of the reasons why people move off their land to go and to move into closer to cities, to, whether it's health or housing, or whether it's um, for training. And yet we've still got police and the army going into these places and sh pushing people out of the houses saying under the COVID laws you can't have any more than this amount of people in there. What they would have been better off to do was work with like if it's Tanner Creek to work with Tunganjera Council, uh, with um, Jalalakari Council or with the uh, local elders groups or with just some of the got some of the local people in the area to go and help whether it be language barriers or, or whatever it is. They could have done it a whole lot different way but just instead of that bombing into a, a place and 
the families in the other houses could see them coming. And families, are, you know, they're alert and the black wire travels well. They t they're telling them ahead of what's going on. And people are heading out of these houses and just heading, they're just leaving them and trying to run back into the bush to get away from these authorities. And it's, it's just really um, chaotic at the moment until we can get something in place that's going to help. But housing's always been a problem and it always will be a problem. So that's some of the things. And the other thing that we're working on in Tennant Creek is when we was there in November, they've been um, throwing kids in the back of uh, these uh, flat top utes with a cage on it, no seat belts. And some of these kids have been driven from there, from Tennant Creek down to the prison at um, Alice Springs. And if anyone had put their kid in a cage and drove them around town, you know what the how many police and people would pull you up and rightly so but yet the police are getting away with it and I think it's happening all over the Northern Territory not just Tennant Creek and uh, that's one of the campaigns that we're working on at the moment. Thank you. Thanks so much Rodney. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Anthony Kelly from the Flemington Kensington Legal Community Legal Centre to tell us a bit about what's been happening as well. Thanks very much Kirsty. Um, Thanks Rodney and Roxanne as well. I, I, I'm down here in um, the very beautiful and always nourishing lands of the Wurundjeri people as well, part of the Eastern Kulin Nations. And um, yeah, it's really interesting to hear this. We, we, whenever we discuss uh, policing, we often, um, as part of the acknowledgement, start with the, uh, the fact that policing in Australia is very, has always been and continues to be very much part of the colonial project. It's uh, part of that legitimization and part of that policing uh, of uh, through a colonial lens. And we're still seeing that today, the legacy of the, of the early military, paramilitary, vigilante um, uh, policing that is part of this country's history is very much um, uh, a live legacy. And the the issues with COVID policing, the policing through this pandemic that we've seen over Australia, we've tracked a little bit through a, a website that we set up uh, in, um, in early April called covidpolicing.org.au. And we, we were calling for testimony and accounts and reports from around Australia of uh, sorts of policing that people were experiencing. Uh, we, start, we were very concerned uh, of the sort of uh, policing that we might see. Uh, we'd been watching, I guess, like many people uh, around the country and around the world, the policing that we'd seen, first of all, in Wuhan under the, the initial uh, lockdown in, chi in China, but also in Italy and in New York uh, and in Spain, in France, in other, in other parts of Europe where the virus was escalating and policing, but, and then there started to be lockdowns and the policing of those lockdowns. Uh, we saw some very disturbing accounts from those countries, and we were a week or two uh, behind a lot of those a lot of those countries. So we had some uh, forewarning, as it were. And um, the COVID policing site was designed in part to capture some of some personal testimony and accounts from around Australia of what was happening. And in the hundred or so reports that we've received so far, there's been some really disturbing accounts, uh, not just from um, remote areas like Tennant Creek, which has been a particular focus where military have been used. And that, that in itself is incredibly disturbing. You can't imagine that in any other uh, non-Aboriginal communities around Australia being accepted or, um, you know, just pe people being okay with that sort, that sort of intervention. But in areas uh, that have already been uh, receiving particular police attention, uh, we we have seen even more police attention. So in areas in Kensington and Flemington and North Melbourne, where we work here at the um, Flemken Community Legal Centre, there's been reports of far more policing than they ordinarily have been experiencing, more stops, more searches, etc. cetera. And um, we also saw in the COVID policing website, um, the sort of policing, the stop and account or exclusionary policing where police would approach someone, ask them what they were doing, where they were going, what was their reason for being outside, uh, and asked, and, uh, you know, people uh, essentially questioned about their reason for being outside. Uh, that sort of stop and account policing is very common to us. The, um, 
common to ex to communities that have ex that are um, have experienced over policing for many many years, and uh, it was starting to be experienced by a, a broader range of the Australian public. That's something we realised very early on: is that uh, police everywhere were stopping people and asking them to account for their movements and their behaviour. And the reports that we were getting were uh, from people who were feeling intimidated, stressed, anxious, um, um, dumbfounded about why they were stopped, uh, questioning why, what, what they were doing. Most, re most reportees uh, were under the impression that what they were doing was, was okay under the COVID restrictions. They had been, they had been um, self uh, distancing, socially distancing and un under lockdown themselves, but were outside for exercise or for walking or for, for what they thought was legitimate reasons, and then had police interrogate them, um, uh, question them, sometimes fine them. And um, but there was a great deal of shock and, um, um, and yeah, just feelings of um, uh, that they were, why, why were they being interrogated, why they were being intimidated, and a lot of outrage from, in, from the people who were being reported. And it was interesting because these stories were really familiar to us. We hit, we'd heard them from our clients uh, around the western suburbs of Melbourne and in Dandenong and in areas that have been um, traditionally over-policed now for air areas. That's the sort of experiences that people have been receiving long before the, pand long before the pandemic hit. And it's a sort of curfew policing, um, exclusionary policing, um, that, as I said, is incredibly common. Um, one of the things about this sort of, uh, about our understanding of the pandemic is that it's been very data driven. So uh, I'm sure most of us here would recognize charts and um, uh, all the stats that have been released by health authorities and government to help us understand transmission rates and how the virus has been progressing um, over, year, over, the, uh, over the months. But, um, our understand, but the data coming from police, however, has been uh, extraordinarily lacking. We, um, we don't have a picture, apart from our reports that have come from communities and individuals and through agencies and um, um, networks and through the COVID policing site, we've got a snapshot and pictures of what's going on, but we don't have the inaccurate view of how policing has been um, played out. Um, I want to share my screen briefly, if that's okay, and just um, just allow me to share quickly. Um, this chart here, hopefully everyone can see it relatively clearly. This is from, um, this is mobile phone data from New York, where uh, you know the virus hit a few weeks before it did here in Australia. And uh, though this uh, particular chart was able to uh, distinguish between the top 10% of income earners, it's from mobile phone data, and it tracks. This is the baseline here, and it tracks movement decline when the lockdown orders came into play. And it shows that the top 10% of income earners in the blue were able to lock down and isolate themselves uh, much more effectively and earlier than the top, the bottom 10% of income earners here in the orange, who were, as you can imagine, made up by you know, um, uh, constituted delivery workers, essential workers, healthcare workers. Uh, people who were less able to, um, or um, less able to stay at home during the stay-at-home restrictions, and more likely to be out and about. So it includes it include people with precarious housing, uh, less able to self-isolate and stay safely at home. What this chart demonstrates uh, more than anything really is that the available population to police. Uh, during these the COVID policing times, uh, was made up of a, uh, a much narrower cross section of the population and much more likely to be from the lower uh, lower socioeconomic strata of society. So statisticians and experts in this sort of area talk about available populations to police stops. So that in itself was quite interesting that 
and that's it was entirely predictable. Police should have known this. Um, police should have been aware of it. So these this portion of the population, the, the bottom 10% or the lower, the lower socioeconomic portion were more susceptible, more likely to be stopped by police, more likely to receive fines. And that's played out in the anecdotal reports so far. The other chart that I want to share, of course, is this one here that's developed by Osman Faruqi from a journalist who's been looking uh, more than most um, journalists at this particular dis discrepancy and discriminatory impact of the policing of these COVID um, fines. And this, this in particular draws out the fines, the, the, uh, the bare amount of information that's been released by the New South Wales Police. And as you can see, some of you might have seen this already, he's written it up in the Saturday paper um, in, uh, you know, during April. But you can see here from the, the more wealthier suburbs in New South Wales, from the northern beach, beaches, that had a high proportion of cases, a higher um, number of cases, 5.3% of cases here, only received a very tiny proportion of COVID uh, infringements or penalty notices. Whereas if you jump to the western, the western suburbs of Sydney over here, you'll see that a very small amount of COVID cases, coronavirus actual cases, have been reported in th these areas, but have received a, a relatively huge proportion of the infringements. So this map, and again in Liverpool, um, you see the similar pattern of a low percentage of coronavirus cases in us and a very high proportion of infringements. And this is something that we would have anticipated, that the areas that already had a high focus of police and in, an intensity of uh, police deployment uh, would, because of that, um, would have received a high level of um, police attention and COVID policing. These areas would have less police and less attention uh, by police and therefore less COVID um, curfew policing and um, infringements. So this in itself is a really critical chart and it and it's uh, borne out by some of the accounts that we receive. Um, this one in particular was an eyewitness report from a person in Glebe who uh, noticed that uh, a vehicle stopped an Aboriginal man who was walking a slightly ahead in the same direction. Um, the Aboriginal man told police that he'd been already been stopped twice in the last 10 minutes. Ironically, he was on his way to the Glebe police station to lodge a complaint about racial profiling. And he reported he'd been stopped 37 times in the past month. He lived in an area for 30 years. This uh, example is quite borne out by the, the person who made the report told us that um, in the other area of Glebe, the wealthier uh, um, part of Glebe further um, down to the water, he was regularly noticing people who were um, not socially distancing, hanging out in parks and hadn't noticed uh, any police presence at all, despite being out every day. Um, but in this area of Glebe, um, further up uh, near Broadway, he was noticing intense police presence. So it's a quite extraordinary that, you know, that this is the sort of discriminatory, uh, racialized and disproportionate policing that various communities have been experiencing right around Australia, not just in Glebe. We're, we're noticing similar things in, um, uh, in our part in the western suburbs in Melbourne and some of the reports that are coming through demonstrate that this is happening. Um, the, of course, the onus is on government and police to make sure that it, that it doesn't. And part of our communication, of course, has always been talking about that this sort of policing, even if it is entirely lawful and procedurally correct has an enormous degree of harms on people experiencing it. Um, not just the stress and anxiety of being stopped, the shame of being stopped in public, uh, being searched. There's the criminalization uh, proce um, process that when, when people are stopped and, and asked to account for their movements, they're more likely to result in other charges, uh, searches, um, the um, offensive language being used, a whole range of other things that um, are often the result of a police stop. And so uh, people, ex communities that are already experiencing this sort of over-policing are more, under COVID, have been more likely to, be, to experiencing um, the harms that have come from this sort of policing.
more likely to um, be criminalised. And again, as, Rock, as Roxanne was highlighting, more likely to end up in a more risky uh, corona, um, a risky custodial settings where the risk of transmission is, is um, higher. Um, and it draws in, it, it basically, all of this um, um, evidence really raises the question about why, why have we allowed this sort of policing with all of its um, consequential harms and impacts on communities and criminalizations and risks to transmission, why have we allowed this sort of policing to be carried out at a time when uh, we've been, uh, the aim is to keep people safe, to reduce the transmission of the violence. Why have we allowed um, this sort of harmful policing to generate um, higher levels of risks? Now, I'm just gonna stop the share. Just bear with me. Um, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll, st I'll just stop there, but um, yeah, that's one of my uh, questions to everyone at the moment. Thank you so much, Anthony, and some very compelling data about how um, the policing's been happening. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, I see there's some good comments and questions and links being shared in the chat. Um, please share them now, because we'll go to um, questions from the audience in a little bit. Um, but I first want to hand back to you, Roxanne, because I think that segue into, you know, we're hearing a lot about how the over-policing is happening, but what is the impact um, in prisons and how government's responding to these kind of confined environments where there's really high risk of transmission. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, yeah, so globally what we've seen is governments from many countries uh, releasing people from prison as the primary response. And that's really the most effective way to reduce um, the risk of the, the spreads the spread of um, coronavirus in those confined settings. Um, you know, everywhere from, you know, Canada, Germany, United States, um, United Kingdom, Indonesia released like 30,000 prisoners. Um, so it's been a response that we've seen globally, but not here at home. So in Australia, um, government, some governments have responded by passing emergency powers um, so that they could release people from prison. Um, however, we're not aware in New South Wales where that's happened um, of anyone actually being released under those laws. Um, and instead, what we've seen happening is um, governments really relying on the courts and lawyers um, to um, have people released through bail and parole proceedings. Um, and that was something um, particularly that our um, ATSOL's lawyers were doing a lot, um, but that's really slowed down now, the ability to release people on those grounds. Um, so it's really the government's deflecting their responsibility and putting that, um, instead of making the proactive move to release people from prison, particularly First Nations people, which is what the majority, everyone's been getting behind those calls, um, the families of those who've lost loved ones in custody, but also um, about 400 academics and individuals came together in an open letter around it. Um, but that is just not what's happening. Instead, prisons are going into lockdown. There's no visits. So people are being cut off from their families, from their supports. Um, phone calls and video conferences aren't always being made available um, to people in prison for free. Um, and we've heard even where there has been um, prison officers testing positive for COVID, not everyone in the prison has been tested. Um, so the testing and availability of medical treatment is of a huge concern. But also in terms of the lockdowns, new people coming into prison are being put into isolation. Um, the isolation procedures are 24 seven in your cell. So that's very concerning from a human rights perspective and how long that's gone on for as well. It sounds a lot like solitary confinement. Um, and if that happens for 15 days, then that actually amounts to torture international law. So we're really concerned about the transparency and oversight of what's actually happening in prison, um, particularly for First Nations people. Um, and just to, I guess, mention, 
the issue around um, what's going to happen when the courts come back. So lots of mob, lots of Aboriginal people in prison are there on remand. Um, and that means they haven't necessarily been found guilty or, or that and they don't have a sentence yet. And all of those people, they've had their matters delayed. So people are spending longer in prison than they perhaps even would for their full sentence. Um, so that's a huge concern as well. Um, and one of the families that we've been working with um, who released the letter that I mentioned earlier, I'll just read a quote from her because I think it really illustrates um, the concerns and um, the fears of First Nations people. Um, so Patricia, it's not her real name, um, Patricia Fisher, um, her daughter's currently in prison and she said, I want my daughter to be released as soon as possible. She has a heart condition and an acute brain injury and she sounds like she's deteriorating. This is the third time she's been refused bail. So she's in on remand. I worry for her mental health. She's shut off from the world. She's usually a bubbly person and she'd rig me all the time, but she doesn't want to talk to anyone on the outside because she's upset. When you talk to a family member, they get to walk away, but you don't. She also has bad hay fever and often has flu-like symptoms. I'm really worried about COVID-19. If she was to come into contact with it, it'd probably kill her. So these are the kinds of concerns that we're hearing from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families, um, especially when there's not a lot of information um, being able to, the um, contacts that you have with people inside is reduced as well. Um, so that's why we've made like a number of calls around the, the need for, you know, appropriate medical care um, for First Nations people who are showing any flu-like symptoms to immediately go to hospital, um, as well as um, their families being notified, um, custody notification services being notified. Um, and we're really, really concerned about the lack of Australian governments releasing First Nations people from prison. As we've seen clearly across the world, that's the best practice for dealing with COVID-19 in the pandemic. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Roxanne. And there's some questions coming through and if others have them as well, but we might throw to um, Emma for Emma King for your question. Um, do you want to jump up on the video or do you want me to ask it? Yeah, Emma? Can you unmute yourself? Hi, everybody. Such a great thing to be part of. Really appreciate this conversation. Um, I'm just saying I'm really, really interested in more discussion or comment from you all about the point that Roxanne just raised about how the policing that's happening is impinging on basic human rights. I think that's something I'd really be interested in more um, discussion on. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks, Emma. And you said in particular, like, the right to protest, the right to movement, freedom and so on. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know, Rodney, is coming from a human rights organisation. Did you want to speak to that first or did anyone else? You're still on mute, my friend. Yeah, it's, yeah I was trying to find the mute button. The, I think that the human rights for Aboriginal people, whether it's been for COVID-19 or for anything else, have been totally disregarded for years. So I think it's been, it becomes acceptable over a period of time to erode the human rights of Aboriginal people in this country. And this is just another one of those storms to ramp it up. And I think that's what worries me about human rights for Aboriginal people in this country, um, whether it's housing or whether it's people, you know, um, when they put things in place uh, like uh, mandatory um, sentencing or anything like that is directed fair at Aboriginal people. So I think that a lot of times when we talk about human rights and the erosion of rights, uh, it's, it's just to a degree of how far each right wing government wants to push to erode human rights for Aboriginal people. And I think it, it's a continuation. And, you know, 20, you know, 30 years ago, we would have thought Malcolm Fraser was a, a fair bit to the right. And then as he was passing, he almost became a left. That's how far we've shifted to the right. And that's how far our human rights have moved in this country to the right. And I, it scares me where it's going. 
Anthony or Roxana, did you want to add anything to that? Sure. So, um, discriminatory policing and racial profiling is essentially unlawful under the Race Discrimination Act. Uh, the onus is on police command and governments to ensure that the policing that they deploy uh, is lawful and non-discriminatory. And unfortunately, at the moment, um, the police are not determining or measuring uh, with any degree of transparency or accuracy uh, whether or not their policing is uh, discriminating particular communities. Uh, the other, uh, so that's the um, reason why we've uh, put a call to various chief commissioners and to government uh, around Australia about the need for um, police forces to release their stop data to an independent body so it can be transparently and independently um, analysed, uh, compared with available, um, with uh, local uh, demographic data and available populations and determined uh, once and for all uh, how disproportionate policing is being carried out and it's, and it's determined its discriminatory nature. And then it can be worked against. We can, uh, we can start working against it um, properly. Um, but until we do that, uh, we, we, um, police forces are not taking responsibility for it. The other component of, uh, um, of course of all this is just the lack of accountability. And so I think someone's mentioned it in, into the, um, uh, in the threads is that uh, we don't yet have anywhere in Australia uh, a human rights compliant uh, independent investigative model where uh, people who have experienced police misconduct or have claims against police can go and have their um, allegations independently investigated. Um, so that's a key problem is that at the moment police are still investigating police around Australia and uh, it's not leading to the human rights outcomes that uh, we need. Thank you, Anthony. I might throw to you again, Roxanne, in a moment, but there's one really clear question coming out from um, people today. So Carlos, Carlos and Caitlin and Valerie have all asked it. You know, what can um, people do to support um, in this moment, especially if you're not part of the community legal or um, advocacy organisations, like what can we all do and are there specific actions we can take? So Roxanne, do you want to answer that first? Um, and I think that looks to, yeah, how do we solve these problems? What's your vision? Um, would be great to share as well. I'll throw to you first, Roxanne, and then maybe we can go to you, Rodney, next. Yeah, thank you, Kirsty. Um, so in terms of what people can do to support, um, particularly for the families um, that we've been working with in their um, clean out prisons campaign. Um, so if you use the hashtag um, on social media, clean out prisons, um, you'll be able to join the discussion there. And there's also a social media action where we're asking people to take a photo of themselves with soap and the hashtag, um, and then actually um, sending that soap to um, decision maker um, uh, attorney generals um, and there's a, a full list with all of a template letter and their addresses um, on the website so i posted those links into the chat there's a petition that we're asking people to sign um, and the petition was started by michaela reynolds whose brother died in custody after um, an asthma attack um, which was a known um, condition to them. And it took 40 minutes um, from the time of him calling for help, um, for help to arrive. Um, and we've been working really closely with Michaela and she says, you know, if the prison system couldn't cope with my brother's asthma condition just in normal times, how is it meant to cope with this pandemic? Um, so the other families of deaths in custody that we've been working with have joined onto that petition as well, and that's been expanded. So the link's in there, so please share that. Um, and I think generally just um, sharing the various, um, their letter, um, the various links that we've, news articles and things that we've shared today um, to make sure that their voices are heard. Um, in terms of what uh, we'd like to see change, um, lockdown is not going to solve um, or fix coronavirus um, or the risks of coronavirus in this pandemic, but decarceration will. Um, and so the change we'd like to see is really um, making sure that all of these injustices, this is an opportunity to um, 
reset how the justice system works and we want to make sure that those um, systemic unfairnesses and discriminations in the system are um, rectified and that there's much more emphasis being put on diversion and um, support for families, um, social, um, social supports, um, family supports, supports for people with disability, um, making sure that families are staying strong and together, um, that our women who are experiencing family violence are getting the right supports, support for our community controlled services. Um, decarceration is the only way um, that there's gonna be justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, and um, also Rodney and I are both part of the Change the Record Coalition um, and They've, um, we've released through Change the Record um, policy positions on that as well. So I'll post the link there too. Great, thank you so much, Roxanne. Rodney, did you want to add anything about what people can do to um, help? Oh, you're still on mute. The, uh, one of the things that we, we've been talking about at Amnesty is about the uh, kids being locked up in the in the um, flat top utes with a cage on them. And we've got a campaign on that. If you go to www.amnesty.org.au, you can sign up to that campaign on the uh, kids in the utes. But just on average, like what Roxy was saying, the, the continuation of these things happening, and we talked about this earlier, if we can't get people out of the prison who have been locked up for some fairly minor things, when there's a, a world pandemic on, what hope are we got of getting them out of the prison for the rest of the time? I think that's my major concern, that, that we're convinced that locking people up in this country achieves nothing, and yet they, can, they continually do it. And that's my concern. And there is people that does need to be locked up, and I'm not against that. I think that, but there's a huge percentage of people that shouldn't be in that prison system and the kids get they get an apprenticeship from when they're 10 years of age to start in that system and once they you know if you've got a 10 year old child who's had three taps with the police and he's in the prison guess where he's going to be when he's 20 it's almost like the prison system is almost like an industry and i think that unless we can break that system down a bit we're going to have hell's own trouble of keeping Aboriginal people out of this prison system for the next 200 years. And if you can imagine how many Aboriginal people have spent time in prison since colonisation. And how many people um, have been, you know, in the early days was put in chains for no reason at all. So some of these reasons why our people are going into this system are fairly paltry in the first place. They're just things for thought, that's all. Thanks so much, Rodney. And um, Anthony, I'll throw to you, but there's another question that's really specific from Alan, and um, given your um, Victoria base, maybe you can answer it as well. So Alan's question is um, the IBAC, which maybe I don't even know what that is, so you could explain it, is currently the only investigator in Australia without the same power as police, and who should we approach within the Victorian government to push for IBAC and police to carry out the recommendations from the IBAC inquiry in 2018? Sure, sure. So, so calls for independent investigation of police are decades old now. It was a key recommendation in the Royal uh, Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. We need uh, well-resourced, well-financed and empowered bodies to be able to go in early, investigate um, a whole range of police misconduct allegations, including deaths in custody, very, very early uh, and have the, um, yeah, have the powers and the ability to do that effectively. Uh, IBAC has been um, a big campaign in Victoria for quite a few years now to, to strengthen IBAC's ability to be that independent investigative body. Uh, we're getting closer, but, we're, but uh, we do have final, many final hurdles. Uh, the Victorian government needs to um, enact the 69 recommendations from the 2018 um, parliamentary inquiry into police misconduct and how it's investigated. Uh, similar calls have been made in other states and territories around Australia and we need each of those bodies and ombudsmen around the country need to have the powers and the ability to independently, effectively, quickly and transparently uh, investigate police misconduct with the, with the uh, victims of that uh, sent, uh, victims of that allegations of police misconduct at the very centre of the investigation. Um, 
So there's a lot of work to do just at that particular level. The other thing I'd say about COVID policing in particular is governments federally and state are currently reviewing the, the government responses into how we've handled the pandemic. Uh, and I strongly believe that policing needs to be central to that review, how, this, how the pandemic and how the stay at home uh, restrictions have been policed needs to be examined on a systemic level. Um, so um, each, uh, wherever you are in Australia, um, either some sort of parliamentary inquiry is probably um, underway or about to start. So I would urge you to talk to your members and, and contacts to make sure that policing is included in that review. Uh, we should be examining the harms that have come from policing and its overall impact on um, enforcing the restrictions. A lot of criminologists and others have pointed out to the fact, uh, pointed out facts that the deterrence and enforcement of fines hasn't necessarily had any um, or much impact on people's um, um, actual willingness to stay at home, that um, the moral weight of the laws, social solidarity, uh, peer pressure, all those sorts of things um, have had a much greater extent than policing and, and the threat of or enforcement of fines. Uh, what the fines have done is further criminalised a whole um, uh, bunch more people and made it more um, and put more pressure on those already um, stressed lives and have had a particular Im uh, harmful impact on, you know, as I said before, already targeted um, impacted communities. Um, so reviewing, systemic reviewing of that. And of course, we, we want this policing um, overall um, a, a, at the moment, we've got an opportunity because a greater range of, Aust of the Australian public has experienced the sort of exclusionary um, policing that has normally um, just been um, experienced by particular targeted communities. So we should be collectively calling for police stop data to be independently analysed and monitored so that we can get a much more accurate picture of discriminatory policing across the board and um, pandemic or no pandemic, um, discriminatory and racialized policing, uh, we need to rein in um, desperately. So data monitoring is a way of doing that. And the, um, uh, and the sort of policing that we've seen over the last uh, six weeks in Australia is a really good way of illustrating the dangers of this sort of policing. Thank you so much, Anthony. And um, we're coming up to the final straight. So if there are any final questions, please do share them. I just noticed Jan Govert has shared um, where you can put in Senate submissions. So I appreciate that. And we will um, send around an email after this with all of the links that have come up as well as um, a link to this recorded um, video. So you can share it with your friends and families and networks. Um, it's been such a valuable discussion. Um, are there any final, I don't think there are any final questions, so I might just throw um, to closing remarks to each of our panellists, maybe a, a minute or two each, and particularly be interesting to hear about some of those other campaigns you're doing around race, the age and so on. And just notice there's been a couple of comments as well around how over-policing impacts refugee communities. So if anyone would like to speak to that, um, please do as well. Um, Roxanne, do you want to do some closing remarks first? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, just on the refugee point, I think that's a, a really important one. And it's certainly something we've been very aware of that um, the issues that, you know, we're experiencing in detention for um, and prisons for First Nations people are very similar to what um, refugee refugees are experiencing um, in places of detention as well. Um, so, yeah, just really wanted to acknowledge that. Um, in terms of um, closing remarks, um, I think, you know, even just to reiterate the point that even though we are seeing um, a decrease in cases in the community, places like prisons, um, the risk of coronavirus remains really high. And it, it, it really will just take one case in there of say a prison officer who's coming in and out of the prisons each day um, for it to absolutely spread like wildfire um, and the risk of Aboriginal deaths in custody is huge. Um, there's been 
about 428 Aboriginal deaths in custody since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, um, which is almost 30 years ago now. Um, and the this is the government's responsibility to ensure that the safety and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, I think that we should all get behind the voices of the families who've lost loved ones in custody and do everything we can to support them um, through the petition and, and sharing those open letters, etc. cetera. Um, and just, I guess, emphasising um, the need for support around our Aboriginal legal services too, especially when the um, courts come back to resume fully. Um, our legal services are like deeply <laughs> under-resourced at the best of times. Um, and there has been a small amount of money um, just announced, which we welcome, but we're not sure how much of that is going to come to us. And we just think that Aboriginal people really need to be prioritised for that because our communities are going to feel the impacts of COVID-19 long after um, restrictions are lifted, um, especially our remote communities, especially in terms of things like housing and child protection and family violence. Um, all of which are deeply connected with the justice system. Um, and I very much agree with everything Anthony and Rodney have said on the over-policing points and that accountability is something that we really need to push for um, going forward and making sure that's a lesson learned um, from this pandemic. Thank you so much, Roxanne. We do have um, one or two minutes left. Um, so Rodney, would you like to make any closing remarks? I think that Rox touched on it as well about the concerns we've got is after COVID-19 is finished, that when there's going to be a lack of funding, the first people's funding that's going to be hit is Aboriginal funding, whether it's housing or whether it's um, law and justice. So we're really concerned on how that's going ahead. And we already know the problem with overcrowding housing uh, around the country is a problem. And it's going, I think it's going to get worse. Uh, it was very clear when um, the Prime Minister said, uh, white people over 70 and Aboriginal people over 50 is endangered with this um, COVID-19. It's very clear indication of where we all sit in society. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rodney. Um, and Anthony? Oh, just um, the the men in, currently um, uh, incarcerated in the Mantra Hotel in Preston have been a particular focus of uh, refugee groups in, in Victoria. Uh, they came over here on the Medivac uh, legislation, so of underlying health needs, and again, are, are, an, are an incarcerated community who have been under threat. And also the 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 difficulties that people have had to protest and highlight their uh, their plight have quite have. Uh, have really um, highlighted some of the problems of uh, being able to protest under the COVID restrictions. Um, uh, protest movements, by and large, have really um, were the first to cancel their events and cancel rallies. And uh, it was a real shame. Uh, and I think it's part of the government neglect uh, and, and uh, their attitudes towards uh, protest and civil society in general that within the public health restrictions, there was little consideration or un understanding of or um, uh, or writing in of protections around um, socially um, safely organised uh, protest events. So the Refugee Action Collective in Melbourne put a lot of effort into organising car convoys and social dis socially distances um, protest events in order to highlight the plight of the mantra detainees. Uh, and yet they were still policed, they were still fined and uh, underpinned. And that was a real unfortunate um, circumstance is that there weren't uh, protections for these for safely organised protest events under the restrictions. Thank you so much to each of you, um, Rodney Dillon, Roxanne Moore and Anthony Kelly. It's been, I can't sum up the conversation because it's been so rich and I'm just so grateful um, and I'm sure everyone here is for sharing your expertise and wisdom and experience um, and lots of calls to action. So we'll make sure we share them around and we'll send around the link as well of this video. So please do share it with your friends and family. It would be great to get more people to hear um, just how they can get involved in supporting campaigns around over-policing and decarceration.
Um, thanks all to the work you do. Um, these sessions happen every weekday, one till two, and we've got sessions um, on poverty this week and um, with um, ACOS next Monday. Uh, and tomorrow we'll be hearing from the Essential Report um, with Peter Lewis and Catherine Murphy. So um, tune in, there's some of the things coming up otherwise. And Osman actually, who was mentioned earlier, Osman Faruqi and his mother, Maureen Faruqi, will be here on Wednesday as well. So I'm sure some of these topics will get touched on again. So thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thanks everyone for calling in and making it such a great session. And um, yeah, thank you so much for the work you do. We're really lucky to hear from you all. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you all. Thanks very much, everyone.